Hello, Hello everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another live stream of Valley Podcast. And today I'm joined by Dr. Bruce Chilton, and we're going to be discussing the synoptic problem. So, Dr. Chilton, welcome back to History Valley. Many thanks. Good to be with you. So, could you explain briefly what is the synoptic problem to those that may never have heard of it before? Of course. Yeah. The basis of discussion of the Gospels takes as its point of departure the fact, and to this extent we can speak of fact, uh, that the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, broadly speaking, uh, follow a very similar narrative trajectory, uh, defined largely by Jesus' baptism, by the transfiguration, uh, by his death and resurrection. Even that simple narrative arc I just referred to is not shared by the gospel according to John. So that suggests that there is a special relationship among the first three gospels. And because it's possible to print the uh, first three gospels out in parallel columns and view them together, uh, they're called synoptic. That is, you can look at them at the same time. And one of the one of the key features and the one of the key issues of the synoptic problem is is the or the main issue that is is that Matthew and Luke share material, a lot of material, not found in Mark. Yes, that's exactly the case. Uh, once you've actually set the Gospels out, as I have just uh, described, your eye will immediately be, be taken up by the simple fact that although there's a large amount of agreement, in absolutely every case, there are certain elements in each Gospel that are unique, that is, that don't appear in the others. Among these uh, unique elements, uh, there are also approximately 200 verses, largely uh, sayings of Jesus, though not entirely, which are shared uh, by Matthew and Luke. Now, I know that several scholars also involve two other issues in, within the synoptic problem, although others will ignore it. Um, that Luke has special material unique to his gospel, not found in the others, and that Matthew also, likewise, has unique material in his gospel, not found in the others. And they'll uh, say to her, they'll, they'll add two more hypothetical documents uh, to uh, f to solve that issue. Q explains the double tradition, the sayings of Jesus between Matthew and Luke, not found in Mark. But M explains Matthew's unique material, and L explains Luke's uh, special material. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, that's right. I mean, this was the classic solution set out by B.H. Streeter uh, within his collection of essays, actually, called The Four Gospels. And he set out this conception of there being, in addition to the shared material, uh, so also material peculiar to Matthew, uh, for example, related to Jesus' birth, uh, and also in Luke, also the opening chapters of Luke. Uh, so the question that emerges when we can see that each of the uh, Gospels is unique, uh, does that mean that we should think in terms uh, of there being separate documents uh, feeding into the Gospels and producing these results? If that is the approach one takes, uh, that is broadly speaking called a documentary hypothesis. Uh, difficulty of that is, however, uh, is that because there is so much material which is actually unique within the Synoptic Gospels, the result could be that you would be multiplying documents uh, to a considerable extent. I think there are two questions involved here. One is, what is the aim of the study? What is it we're attempting to achieve as we look into the issue of the relationships among the Gospels? And the other is, in what medium do we think that the materials prior to the Gospels were passed on? I personally am very skeptical of the idea that everyone in Christianity was as concerned to write down information in regard to Jesus as scholars today would like them to be.
So do you believe in uh, in this case that, um, based on what you just said, are you skeptical of the M and L hypothetical sources then? I can't say that I'm more skeptical of them than I am of the so-called Q source. Uh, Q is the designation commonly used for the material shared by Matthew and Luke. And it takes its name uh, from the first letter of the German word Kefela, which means source. Uh, there are two th certain things we can say about Q. One was that it wasn't called Q in antiquity. And the other is that as uh, Streeter himself pointed out, this material shared by Matthew and Luke is in fact not unknown to Mark. There are indications of overlap there. The issue here is whether we really are talking about completely separate documents. Uh, Streeter himself observed that. He once remarked that the overlap between what's in Mark and what's in Q is actually more certain than the existence of Q itself. Uh, that, to my mind, is an accurate appraisal, and it's very revealing of what the relationship among the Gospels is. So I pulled this up on the screen. Um, this, is, uh, B this is a diagram of B.H. Reader's four document hypothesis. Yes, there you are, and a very nice one. I don't think his original was in color, so that looks good. What do you think about the other ones that he adds here, like the Antiochian document, Proto Luke? He's got he's got L using uh, is being used by Proto Luke. Luke's using Proto Luke, not not L. So Luke is indirectly using L by using a source in between them. Like, uh, I guess is what, the correct way of putting it, and the uh, the document of infancy. Yes, you see, the number of documents we have to suppose. Where are the scribes available to this very small movement uh, who are active in the period uh, prior, certainly to the 70s, in the case of the Gospel according to Mark? It seems to me that we're dealing with an essentially implausible understanding of what the media of communication are. As far as we can see, if we look both at accounts of how early Christian preaching happened uh, and also at internal considerations within the Gospels, the medium was primarily not written, not scribal, uh, but rather oral. And by taking up an oral approach to the question of how the Gospels are related to one another, it seems to me that we can arrive at a much more internally consistent and convincing solutions. Would you be more, in this case, would you be more friendly to the so less complex diagram, in which Matthew and Luke are ignorant of each other, but they're using Mark and Q? Yeah, well, this, of course, is the diagram that won. <laughs> that is to say, uh, it is likely the one to be preferred in usual teaching of people who are formed within the study of the New Testament. And I think one reason that it won is simply that it is less complex. However, we need to bear in mind the price that we pay for simplifying in some cases. I said earlier on that each of the Gospels is actually, to some extent, unique. And this diagram does not take adequate account of that uniqueness at all. Uh, it doesn't show us, for example, that the story of the slaughter of the innocents occurs only in Matthew, or the story about uh, the song that the father of John the Baptist sang prior to his birth is only in Luke, or indeed that only in Mark will you find the parable of the seed growing by itself. What it actually excludes uh, at the same time that it includes. So although it's easier to learn, and everyone I think loves it for that reason, I mean, can you ask of anything more straightforward if you're teaching a first year class in the New Testament? <laughs> 
as, as I regularly do. Trouble is, as I say, it excludes so much. I'm not sure really what it is supposed to be telling us, uh, except that whoever forwards this kind of model somehow feels confident that we can explain how the Gospels worked on the basis of the copying of previous sources in writing. And I'm not at all sure that's the case. And uh, I think it was in the prior episode, if I remember correctly, um, you said that you have recently become convinced that Mark knew the Q document. And, uh, and that's going to have to do with this next diagram here, the, the free document hypothesis. Um, so I, I know that there are scholars that also say that, other scholars that say that Mark knew Q, but some of them will say, well, on top of that, Luke knew Matthew. Yeah, in this diagram, in the, in the free yes, diagram. that's right. And what I would say is this: is let's 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 imagine that we take out the part of the diagram where Matthew directly influences Luke, which I don't think is is plausible. And let me say, I don't think it's plausible because one has to go case by case, looking in a synopsis where everything's printed out in Greek, and ask oneself. How is one presentation related to another? Is it a matter directly of scribal copying? And I don't think one can account for Luke on the basis of that kind of direct copying, certainly of, of uh, Matthew. But, but having said that, let's just look at the Q part of this. And let's at the same time imagine that uh, this material consisting of about 200 sayings of Jesus, as I said, or rather 200 verse equivalents of sayings of Jesus, let's imagine that this is indeed circulating in antiquity. What makes us think for a moment it is not the only, uh, what makes us think it is the only oral collection of teaching within the early church? Uh, we know that there are other very important teachers who worked orally, uh, such as Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, both of whom Paul says he consulted with in Jerusalem around the year 35 uh, in order to endorse his teaching. Uh, what makes us think that uh, figures such as Barnabas, the sometime companion of Paul and Mary Magdalene, who is very prominently mentioned uh, in the Gospels and seems to have a special association with stories of exorcism, also had no influence. In other words, if we begin with people whom we know we're teaching, instead of starting with documents which we don't know existed, it seems to me that we'll come to a better understanding of this relationship. So why do you think that Matthew and Luke could not have known one another? What What is the enormous difficulty in saying, uh, and trying to put it in either direction, that Luke, Luke knew Matthew or Matthew knew Luke? What, what are the difficulties sure, that, yeah. that's, that they're independent of one another? Mm -hmm. uh, one has to do with, with content. Uh, that is to say, if you think as in this diagram that we have before us, so that's where, where I will start. If you think that Luke directly understood Matthew and therefore, I guess, on the basis of the hypothesis, decided to make changes, uh, then you're not merely saying that Luke is unfamiliar with material in Matthew that Luke does not reproduce. You're saying that Luke decided not to refer to it. Uh, not to refer, for example, to the three wise men visiting the family of Jesus. Uh, not to use Matthew's method of presenting the events concerning Jesus in terms of the fulfillment of scripture. Uh, not to include the final scene of Matthew where Jesus appears risen from the dead in Galilee and gives the great commission to his disciples. All that we have to imagine Luke, what, didn't think was important, uh, wanted to contradict, 
Luke, as a matter of fact, doesn't have any resurrection appearance at all in Galilee. Why should that be the, the case? Uh, the extent of the changes involved would be at least as striking as the amount of overlap if we suppose the use one gospel of another. Uh, those are the difficulties involved simply in terms of content. And then uh, you have to turn to the questions of actual word choice. You know, the gospels seem very similar to one another if you read them quickly and if you generalize. But if you look at what decisions are involved when you copy one document uh, from another, then you expect there to be improvement of uh, grammar and style as you move uh, one gospel to another. And one of the reasons that the hypothesis of something like Q does well is that sometimes it seems that the earliest version of a given saying appears more in Matthew, sometimes it appears more in Luke, sometimes it appears more in Mark, as Streeter observed. That situation would not be covered by the hypothesis of one uh, gospel copying another. So would you say about this next diagram here describes your view better than Matthew, Luke, and Luke, Acts, New Mark, and Q? Let's see. Um, the I let's take uh, mar, the, that mark that green box mark for uh, just a moment, and then the relationship with Q is being done uh, in order to show that Mark's involved with all three. So yes, I like that. Uh, the uh, difficulty here is we have to answer the question. Uh, and by the way, we just have to scrape out acts, don't, don't we? <laughs> I mean, oh, that, yeah, that, that, that's, that's not part of the equation. Right. But, uh, that, we, can, yeah. we can nonetheless uh, work with this idea of the mutual influence of this Q-like material on all three Gospels, which I think is a fine idea. Because largely speaking, not entirely, uh, because largely speaking, the material in Mark uh, is uh, included within Luke and Matthew, uh, we could say, yes, that this actually does work uh, a little bit better. And at the same time, of course, this diagram uh, permits the material of Q uh, both directly to go towards Luke and Matthew and to do so by means of Mark. And there is very good evidence that the material we call Q was composed in stages. But of course, to go back to your four document uh, uh, diagram, uh, we, we still haven't accounted in this new diagram uh, for the special material that we have in Matthew and the special material that we have in Luke. So that I, I would say would be my reason for a bit of reserve, even about uh, this somewhat improved diagram. Um, it also doesn't explain why there should be that kind of enormous uh, preference uh, given to the so-called Q as a source when, in fact, the real mystery to be explained is why this rather durable a narrative arc that I began with should have been so long lasting and so pervasive. And it seems to me that the reason for it is that the basic structure of baptism, uh, transfiguration, following by the close of the gospel, uh, punctuated by healing activity, is actually the model of the preaching of Peter uh, which he gives in the house of Cornelius. And this was an observation that was made uh, about the same time, actually, as B.H. Streeter uh, by C.H. Dodd. So Dodd suggested, in my opinion, correctly, that 
what Mark represents and Luke and Matthew is actually the basic paradigm and much of the uh, content of the preaching of Peter. Uh, so you... the, the, the durability would then be explained on the basis of his authority, which in turn was, was based on his actual success as a preacher. So would you say, let, let me rephrase that. Are you saying that you would keep M and L in the diagram, the diagram? Well, if, if I'm, uh, if I'm required to uh, work in a documentary fashion, then I, I would say yes to that. But I would, I would also uh, introduce a, a major qualification, which is that I do not think of these influences as uh, documents. I think of these influences as being people. So, for example, the special material in Luke, which, you know, understandably, uh, it comes to be known as L or Proto-Luke, but I think specifically relates to the teaching of Barnabas, the companion of Paul, who also uh, has a, uh, I would say, obviously positive relationship to Luke, as we can tell from the book of Acts. Uh, similarly, uh, special materials in the gospel according to Matthew, I would associate uh, with James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, and that also helps us to understand why it should be that Matthew's gospel should be the gospel, which is so concerned with the issue of the Judaic identity of Jesus. Uh, in other words, the change I would want to make is think in terms of people rather than documents. Uh, and that means that we cannot uh, name uh, blocks of written tradition. We have to ask ourselves, uh, what are the cycles of oral tradition which were circulating in the first century in the Mediterranean world, which were then brought together in the case of each of the Gospels? So you're saying that Barnabas and Peter could read could replace M and L basically as the special sources behind Matthew and Luke. Yeah, that's right. That uh, J J James for the uh, Mithian material, uh, Barnabas for the so-called L material. That's right. And you also, we also, I think, have to ask ourselves: Well, who, just who in antiquity would be in a position to collect? the equivalent of 200 verses of Jesus' teaching, and then to hand that on as authoritative. Well, I would associate that with the work of the 12, uh, the 12 apostles who gathered in Jerusalem after uh, the crucifixion and resurrection and made that the center of their activity. So I would, I would describe what we commonly call Q, which as I say, we know it wasn't called Q, as being rather the equivalent of a Mishnah, which would be gathered by a rabbi. Usually a rabbi would do that during the course of his life. But uh, Jesus, unfortunately, died uh, at a young age for a rabbi. And therefore, that work of completing his Mishnah uh, had to be accomplished by his followers. So if I, if I remember correctly, you said that Barnabas is is the is the accounts for the source material behind Luke, the unique behind source Luke. material. That's right. And, and Peter would be that for Matthew. Uh, uh, James, I would say, is a special material for Matthew. Uh, James for Matthew. And for Mark, it would principally be Peter. In other words, I think that the closest uh, analog we have to the preaching of Peter as a whole is, I think, the gospel according to Mark. And incidentally, this is also consonant with what is said by sources from the time of the second century, uh, namely that Mark's uh, gospel was based upon the preaching of Peter. So are you suggesting that Peter could have written the Q document? No, no, not, not, I, I would say uh, Peter is, is not, in my opinion, the primary authority of the Q document. I think that's the 12 as a whole. Okay. I think there's a, there's a collective authority behind 
the so-called document Q, uh, and that collective is is reflective of the twelve. I think that uh, Peter is better reflected in Mark, and then best reflection in Luke of the special material. Anyways, Barnabas, and in the case of Matthew, James. Are there any other materials that you think could have existed um, that are lost that could have that could have influenced uh, the Synoptic Gospels? I do think that I mentioned Mary Magdalene earlier, and uh, I do think that the way in which uh, she features in respect of the key early practices of exorcism and anointing uh, suggests that those materials represent uh, her influence. Uh, and I think another major kind of work which we need to uh, take account of uh, occurs in the period uh, after the resurrection when there are not only the initial followers of Jesus, but uh, figures uh, such as Silas, who was very uh, closely associated with James, the brother of Jesus, as we know from the book of Acts. Uh, and it seems to me that figures such as Silas uh, would account for a very distinctive kind of material uh, which we have in the Synoptic Gospels, which stands out from the rest. And that is Mark chapter 13, and the equivalent to that in Luke and Matthew. Uh, this is the so-called apocalyptic discourse in which uh, Jesus is presented majestically as being the son of man and as the son of man about to judge the earth. That is a distinctive theology and the presentation of the material is as a whole discourse, which is unique within the synoptic gospels. And uh, that suggests to me that we are dealing there with the contribution of Silas. Okay, so I'm about to put up this diagram now. Um, so is this, well, it's, it's still loading, hold on one second. Sure. Here it is. Is this an accurate uh, diagram based on uh, your position? Uh, well, it's, it's getting closer. This, by the way, is really very good. And this is impressive. Um, it, it is indeed getting closer. I would just make a few comments. Uh, one is, although it's quite true, I think the unique material in Matthew is best explained by James, and likewise we say the same thing for Barnabas, best ex explaining Luke. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, James and Barnabas influence uh, only uh, Matthew and Luke. Uh, they are also contemporaries of Mark, so I do not uh, discount, and in fact, at times I identify uh, places where Mark, too, is well aware of what Barnabas and James are doing. Uh, then I'll back up a little bit and, and look at Q. Again, I, I would want to call that uh, Jesus Mishnah rather than Q. Uh, but having said that, I like very much that we see it through the diagrams influencing all three Gospels, so that works out well. Um, in the case of Peter, however, I would want to do the same thing. That is, I would not want to discount the influence of Peter on uh, Luke and Matthew, as well as upon Mark. Uh, in other words, once these cycles of material are circulating, uh, they can, in fact, uh, influence any of the Gospels. Uh, so let's just imagine for the moment that we're in the first century. Uh, this is a new movement. We have no distinctive scriptures. Our only scriptures are whatever version of the scriptures of Israel we read, depending upon our language. Uh, for most of us who are reading gospels, that will be Greek, the Greek of the Septuagint. But then... Uh, in the, the homeland of Jesus' movement, most of the earliest followers are speaking Aramaic, and most of them know those scriptures also by heart rather than in writing. 
So for us, whether we're active in Aramaic or in Greek, our authorities are people like James and Peter and Barnabas, and I would say the 12 in the case of Q. And then I would also want to add in Mary Magdalene. So you're saying that sorry, you're saying, go right ahead. So you're saying that Matthew is familiar with both Barnabas and James's teachings and Mark and Peter. And the yeah. same thing for Luke being familiar with Barnabas, Mark, James, and Peter as well. And they and they are influences. And so you see the task before an evangelist. It's very much like what Luke reports actually at the beginning of his gospel, and then again at the beginning of the book of Acts, uh, they have a great deal of what I would call ear witness testimony. And the question is, how is all of this to be brought together and presented for the particular purposes for which these gospels are written? And in each of these cases, I think the purpose really is to prepare candidates for baptism. Uh, which was a crucial activity for this movement and helps us to explain why it is, for example, that the gospel according to Mark actually begins there, begins with the issue of baptism rather than with the issue of Jesus' birth. I think that's because that's exactly its central concern, uh, which, which it is representing very faithfully as coming from the paradigm of Peter. So were you saying earlier that James and Barnabas were also using Peter? Did I hear that correctly? Uh, I do think there are times uh, when James and Barnabas show an awareness of Peter's teaching. Yes, I think it's right. But I'm not sure uh, whether that has occurred on a consistent basis before James and Barnabas exerted their influence on gospels. Uh, when your model is of cycles of tradition which are being circulated at the same time, uh, the possibility of interaction among them is always present. Uh, it would be very much a situation that we have within the development of rabbinic literature, where one rabbi can be presented as speaking and it can be reminiscent of what another rabbi says, even when there's not direct quotation. Uh, I take that to be one of the signs that we're dealing with a very lively oral environment. So would you say about this diagram? Well, there you better go. Better represents what you were uh, suggesting. Let's see, this is, I'm just looking at the lines. Uh, we got Peter. Y yes, I, I think, yes. I mean, the idea of Peter going to James and then James off. Can we have, does this get some James material to Luke? That would be the one thing okay. I guess I would like. Uh, sure. And then on the Barnabas side, yes, uh, Barnabas being aware of Peter, then going to Mark and to Luke, that's good. And then do we have some Barnabas getting over to um, Matthew? I would, I would want that too. I'm not, okay. again, I'm not taking that out. And then the mission of Jesus, yes, going to uh, Mark, but also to Luke and Matthew. Mm -hmm. Actually, there are two lines of it going to. Are there two? Okay, that's great. That's great. Yeah, the lines are getting a little messy. <laughs> they do that. And yeah. this is, right, this this is the challenge of uh, diagramming, is that, uh, and, you know, and now I guess we have a complexity which is commensurate with Streeter's diagram. Uh, and therefore not as simple as the famous two source hypothesis, you know, can't we just say Mark and Q? Uh, but you know, uh, for the sake of work I was doing on a new Synopticon, which is just coming out, I was rereading not only Streeter, but more 
uh, recent uh, scholars such as Raymond Brown. And Brown said the, the simple version, the Mark Q version, that can't be right, but it's, it's straightforward to teach and it, it, it doesn't do too much harm. So I, I don't think that's an especially strong uh, commendation. So I would, I would rather uh, risk the element of, of complexity. And you, you have shown that it uh, can be drawn. And, uh, you know, sometimes people use colored lines. I'm always a bit careful about color because I'm colorblind myself, but uh, that can be helpful. Okay, let me just uh, get, rid of this, uh, get rid of this diagram for a second here. Okay. Sure. So you think that Barnabas and, and uh, James like I, like I was asking earlier, they are essentially M and L, but they're not as described as M and L are. They're a little different. You think they contained more material than just the unique material, since you think that yes. both yes. of them influence both Gospels simultaneously. Yeah, I, I think they certainly do. For mm -hmm. example, James, it seems to me, is the authority behind the teaching that uh, Jesus' Last Supper was specifically a Passover meal. Uh, because if you identify it as a Passover meal, uh, that has certain immediate consequences. For example, only Israelites can take part in it. Uh, and this coheres with James' position that essentially the whole movement of his brother uh, should be seen as what he called uh, setting up the tent of David. Uh, similarly, Barnabas has got a particular interest uh, in the whole conception of moral purity, uh, which we can also see represented across the Synoptic Gospels, and not only in the special material in Luke. So yes, both James and Barnabas have a much uh, deeper influence than just that special material. And it would be a shame to attempt to circumscribe their influence only to the special material. Similarly, in the case of Mary Magdalene, you know, it's routine at this stage to speak of the importance of Mary Magdalene in connection with stories of Jesus' resurrection. And of course, I thoroughly agree with that. But if someone was an authority <laughs> for the resurrection, doesn't it strike you that she might just have had influence someplace else? <laughs> of course, right. <laughs> you know, uh, especially, especially because uh, stories of Jesus' exorcism, interestingly, happen geographically near Magdala, where she was born, where she got her name. And she is the only person in the Gospels who is the named recipient of Jesus' exorcisms. So it appears to me to be the case that the, the Gospels themselves are telling us that she is an important authority of one of these cycles of tradition, comparable to what were produced by James and Barnabas and the Twelve and Peter. I'm just going to address this super sticker real quick, and then I'll ask my final question. Uh, depressed on one man. Thank you for your super sticker. He has no question today. Okay. Some say that Luke knew Matthew, or they'll flip it and say Matthew knew Luke because they're trying to explain the minor agreements. Mm -hmm. I mean, that s several scholars insist means well, one of them had to know the other. I mean, come on. How do you explain those minor agreements? That's weird. They just both came up with that independently. And I heard that sometimes fix it by saying Mark, there was a copy of Mark with the minor agreements, uh, some hypothetical version of Mark with the minor agreements in it. Yes. What do you that, think about that? Yeah, that's right. That That is a one way of dealing with it in a direct uh, copying solution uh, is to argue that they are generated by, just as we have a proto-Luke, why can't we say we have a proto-Mark? Uh, there again, that that's what I mm -hmm. call, you know, documentary multiplication. Uh, we don't know that any of these things even ex ever existed as a single document. So the mm -hmm. idea that prior to the Gospels, we should have multiple documents is not a way that strikes me as being helpful. My own uh, approach to this issue is to suggest that uh, 
you are dealing with contemporaneous circulation of materials, which as a matter of fact will predictably uh, produce results such as the minor agreements. What's interesting about the minor agreements is they're minor. What, what, what do we mean by that? We mean that they occur in a situation in which there is in fact substantial integrity on the part of the gospels. And yet in the midst of that, sometimes you get this echoing. And that echo effect, I think, is one of the characteristics of an oral tradition. So you think that the minor agreements actually show that Matthew and Luke didn't know one another because they 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 have they do have a lot they do have a lot of agreement with uh, um, in in terms of having a lot in common with Mark, but they don't really take anything from one another so obviously that one must have known the other. I would say so exactly, and it it, it is for that very reason that uh, those who support the idea of a documentary cue uh, make make their argument. Again, I, I don't uh, necessarily support the idea of a documentary cue, though I agree that it was a stable uh, group of traditions that were circulating independently. Uh, I simply ask the question, at what stage uh, should we think in terms of this oral uh, circulation of materials becoming a document. One thing we can know with a degree of certainty is that it happens in the case of the Gospels. It is also plausible that there may have been documents before the Gospels. Uh, there could also have been documents which were actually designed in the interests of oral circulation. What do I mean by that? Well, the whole of rabbinic literature, right, is in principle oral. Uh, when you give the Aramaic uh, translation of the Hebrew Bible in the synagogue, the Talmud tells you to do that orally. You're not allowed to look at a written document. Yet we know that there are written targument, uh, targums because we actually have the documents. So that suggests that sometimes things are written uh, in the interests of oral communication. Uh, so is that a document or is that an oral tradition? Uh, it, is, it is those two at one at the same time. Well, thanks for joining me today once again, Dr. Chilton. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for your diagrams. I think they're quite impressive. Thank you. Uh, there's a... Uh, let, me, let me just explain this real quick. And uh, Yeah, the first three of them I did not create. They were I found them on the internet, but the but the one with uh, the the fourth one, however, the one I kept modifying there, the, I I created that one. You know? Yeah, excellent, good. I think it's productive. Well, thanks again, Doctor. Good to talk to you. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron, and or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.